Good evening, and welcome to another Friday night meeting. Uh, today, of course, we are going to continue studying Hosea. We're going to complete our study of Hosea. And Hosea is God's redeeming love in reality. And we're going to, the, the, the last four chapters of Hosea, which is 11 to 14, really speak about a God that is a redeeming God. And we're going to talk about that. But before I do that, I just want to um, ask the Lord to bless the meeting tonight. I want to ask you that you, uh, uh, you praise the Lord for the blessings. And so let's just pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I want to thank you, Father, for your amazing grace. Lord, as we are going to spend a couple of hours together, I want to ask, oh, Father, that the Holy Spirit be present. Pour the Holy Spirit in our midst, not only here in this, in, in this study, study hall, but Lord, Lord, in every heart that reaches out to watch this presentation and this study. Heavenly Father, I want to ask that you enlighten our minds with the Word of God, that we may understand your appeal your appeal for us to give our heart to you, to walk with you, and to walk with you in unity until you come for us. Bless this evening's meeting, for I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. As a, as a matter of introduction, and uh, I want to simply say that in our survey of the book of Hosea, and by the way, Byron and and Barbara and I have uh, really unpacked the book of Hosea, so I, I'm the last of the, of the three of us teachers. In our survey of the book of Hosea, we have proposed the theme as God's redeeming love. This may seem strange. It may seem strange particularly as we consider God's indictment of Israel as we read in chapters 4 to 7. And as we consider God's punishment for Israel, as we studied in chapters 8 to 10. But as we saw in the first three chapters, Hosea's experience with Gomer, his wife, which for all purposes represents Israel, serves as an analogy of God's experience with Israel. Note, following the adultery, in other words, we're talking about Gomer's adultery. There was a period of separation. So, Hosea and Gomer were separated. And following the separation, there was the ultimate restoration. And therefore, Israel would be restored, but only after a period of separation. And if you know Bible history, you know that that took place. Here is another way to summarize Hosea's chapters 4 to 14. God is holy, which is why he must indict Israel for her sins, for Israel was wicked. God is just, which is why Israel must be punished for her sins. Hosea chapters 8 to 10. But God is also love, which is why he will restore Israel. Hosea chapter 11, verses 14. Therefore, having declared the holiness and justice of God, Hosea now proclaims his great love for Israel. Please note, in this lesson, we will complete our study of Hosea by looking at God's promise of a future restoration. And that is going to apply to you and it's going to apply to me. Okay, so God's promise of a future restoration is our, this is the title for the last four chapters of the book of Hosea. And it's divided into four sections. So here's the first. God's love despite Israel's rebellion. God's love despite Israel's rebellion. Chapters 11. God brought Israel out of, out of Egypt, yet they worshipped the Baals. In Hosea chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, we read, 
When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. As they called them, so they went from them. They sacrificed to the Baals and burned incense to carved images. These two verses provide a description of an exemplary father's amazing care and the prodigal son's waywardness. God's love for his people contrasts with their lack of appropriate response to his solicitude, thus depicting both a tragic and a beautiful story at the same time. God's concern and interest in and for Israel was indeed that of a father towards his son, an interest no other nation shared with the same extent as we read in Deuteronomy chapter 7, Verses 6 to 8. Will somebody read that for me? For you are holy, people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the people on the face of the earth. Amen. The Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people. For you were the least of all the people. Yep. Beautiful words to describe a father in love with the children that he has. The prophet Hosea tells us that this relationship was established by God with Israel at the time when Moses gave the Lord's message to Pharaoh to let his people go, as we read in Exodus 4, 23 We're not going to read that, but the verse is that for you to check on. Hosea 11, 1 shows that the one chief design of the Bible is to recommend to sinners the goodness and grace of God. Martin Luther, and that's Martin Luther King, tells us that the whole scripture aims, is, uh, it's Martin Luther, sorry, not Martin Luther King. Martin Luther tells that the whole scripture aims especially at this, that we doubt not, certainly hope and trust and believe that God is gracious, merciful, and long-suffering. Ellen G. White in Prophets and Kings, page 312, tells us, Tenderly, the Lord had dealt with Israel in their deliverance from Egyptian bondage and in their journey to the Promised Land. My presence shall go with thee, and she quotes Exodus thirty-three fourteen, was the promise given during the journey through the wilderness. This assurance was accompanied by a marvelous revelation of Jehovah's character, which enabled Moses to proclaim to all Israel the goodness of God and to instruct them fully concerning the attributes of their invisible king. Please note that the experience of Israel's deliverance from Egypt was declared by the gospel writer of Matthew under the guide of the Holy Spirit, to be a figure of prophecy of the experience of the child Jesus in Egypt and his return to Palestine. So we read in Matthew chapter 2, verses 14-15 as follows. When Joseph arose, he took the young, he took the young child um, and his other, um, and his mother, that should have been uh, mother, and his mother night and departed for Egypt and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I called my son. Unfortunately, however, in Hosea chapter 11, verses 2, God tells Israel that they failed to acknowledge his call through various prophets and other messengers. He employed and sent to them to make known his will, Instead, they refused to acknowledge the call of God. They turned to idolatry, especially to Balaam and the various representations of the god Baal. Secondly, God nurtured Israel through, uh, though they knew it not. This is... This is an incredible statement here. If you read uh, verses 3 and 4 of chapter 11 of Isaiah, we read, I taught Ephraim, and by the way, Ephraim is a word for Israel. 
I taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by their arms, but they did not know that I healed them. Verse 4, I drew them with gentle cords, with ends of love. I was to them as those who take the yoke from their neck. I stooped and fed them. Can you see a mother stooping down to a child and feeding the child? Hosea 11, chapter, uh, chapter 11, verses 3, provides a beautiful picture of God's loving care for Israel. Just as a loving parent teaches a child to walk, taking it up by the arms when it stumbles and falls, so the Lord had taught his son Israel, as we read in, in scriptures. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 31 says, In the wilderness where you saw how the Lord your God carried you as a man carries his son in all the way that you went until you came to this place. Deuteronomy chapter 33, verses 27. The eternal God is your refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. He will thrust out the enemy from before you and will say, destroy the enemy. Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 32. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in that day that I took them by the end to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. God provides a covenant, establishes a relationship. Just as a loving father patiently bears with a child, who has not yet come to the age of discretion. And this was the condition of Israel in the beginning. So had the Lord borne patiently with his undeveloped people, people who were ignorant of the spiritual mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. And so in De Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 10, we read, God found Israel in a desert land and in the wasteland, a howling wilderness, he encircled him, and he kept him as the apple of his eye. In Prophets and Kings, page 296, Ellen G. White says, Despite the efforts of Satan to thwart God's purpose for Israel, nevertheless, even in some of the darkest hours of their history, when it seemed as if the forces of evil were about to gain the victory, the Lord graciously revealed himself. He spread before Israel the things that were for the welfare of the nation. I have written to him the great things of my law. Ellen White quotes from Hosea 8.12. And he declared through Hosea, but they were counted as a strange, a strange thing. I thought Ephraim, I taught Ephraim to walk talking them by their arms, but they did not know that I healed them. She quotes from Hosea 11.3. Tenderly, says Ellen White, the Lord that dwelt with them, instructing them by his prophets, line upon line, precept upon precept. In Hosea 11.4, chapter 11, verses 4, we see that God drew Israel with gentle cords and bands of love. This is a further picture of the Lord's fatherly guidance of Israel. Here is how Jeremiah describes God's loving kindness. Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 3. The Lord has appeared of all to me, saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. God uses neither hard cords nor iron bands to draw us to him. Instead, God draws us to him by rational means, curting our intelligence and appealing to our affections. And so Isaiah chapter 1, verses 18 says, Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. I want you to pay attention to this passage of Scripture because it's significant. God is a father that wants to sit down with you and 
together with you. And at that reasoning, God does incredible things as you begin to open your heart to him. Forgiveness and cleansing. That's what that, that verse says. God draws us in a manner suitable to the dignity of our nature as those made in the image of God as described in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. As we read, or as we read in the Gospels, Christ drew us with the cords of a man when he became man and lived and sacrificed himself for our good. John 12, 32 tells us, And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, this is Christ's words, will draw all peoples to myself. Acts 10, verses 38 says, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with the power, went about doing good and healing, all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. On this earth, the Spirit and Christ were forever together in their ministry. One of the reasons the Son of God became man was to draw man with the cords of sympathy by partaking of a common nature with them. In addition, as we read in Hosea chapter 11, verses 4, the Lord granted to Israel his saving mercy and tender compassion. Along with abundant sustenance, this is who our God is like. King David tells us in Psalm 23, 5, you prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup runs over. This made it all the more inexcusable for Israel to resort to other gods for their security and livelihood. But thirdly, God will send Israel to Israel, God will send Israel to Assyria because of the, their backsliding. We're talking about about chapter 11. He is God appealing. He is God calling. And now God is loving. And now God is saying, you are going to be going somewhere else. That's exactly right. And we are going to read that. So Isaiah 11, 5 to 7 tells us that, somebody read that for me, please. Israel should not return to the land of Egypt. But the Assyrian shall be their king, because they refuse to repent, and the sword shall slash in their cities, devour their districts, and consume them, because of their own counsels. My people are bent on backsliding from me, though they call to the Most High, none at all exalt him. Yep. So let's unpack these, these verses. And that's what, what we are doing as we this document. We are unpacking these verses. So verse 5 tells us that Israel had been a tributary to Assyria since the time of King Menahem. They were subjected to make payments to Assyria as part of the agreement made by both leaders, Menahem, king of Israel, and Pul, king of Assyria. Here is how the scripture describes what happened. So what, what, what are we reading? An agreement between Israel, God's nation, with Assyria, a nation that had no desire to be part of God's children. So that's, that's what happens here. For 2 Kings 15, verses 17, 20. In the 39th year of Azariah, king of Judah, Menahem, the son of Gadi, became king over Israel and reigned 10 years in Samaria. Wait was the capital of Israel. Verse 18. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord and did not depart all his days from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who had made Israel sin. Verse 19. Paul, king of Assyria, came against the land, and Menahem gave Paul a thousand talents of silver, that his hand might be with him to strengthen the kingdom under his control. Can you see what happened? There's now an agreement made between Israel and Assyria. There was a payment made. If we need your help, you come and help us, Assyria. And Menahem exacted the money from Israel, from all the very wealthy, 
from each man 50 shekels of silver to give to the king of Assyria. So the king of Assyria turned back and did not stay there on the land. But the story goes on. This harsh agreement and payment provoked Israel to revolt and seek help from Egypt. Huh? They didn't turn to God. They went and looked to another nation, Egypt. So let's read 2 Kingdoms, chapter 17, verses 1 to 4. In the twelfth year of Ahaz, king of Judah, Oshea, the son of Elah, became king of Israel in Samaria, and he reigned nine years. Verse 2, And he did evil in the sight of the Lord, but not as the kings of Israel that were before him. Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, came up against him, and Oshea became his vassal, and paid him tribute money. And the king of Assyria then covered a conspiracy by Oshea, because he had sent messengers to Saul, king of Egypt, and brought no tribute to the king of Assyria, as he'd done ear by ear. Therefore the king of Assyria shut him up and bound him in prison. So what was the result? Consequently, no help was permitted to come from Egypt, and Israel would be compelled to submit to the yoke of Assyria. Please note, the Assyrian bondage became a chastisement to Israel for their unrepented sins. That's verse 5. In verse 6, the Lord tells Israel that there will be no escaping the invasions kingdoms and its effects. The cause of all these coming afflictions was the nation's evil counsel, which led the people into transgression and apostasy. And yet, in spite of the transgression and the apostasy, in verse 7, God calls Israel, my people. I want us to pay attention to that. Israel gets away, becomes prodigal, just like the prodigal son. And God says, that's my people. My people. This shows God's commitment towards his people. God continued calling Israel to fellowship with him. Unfortunately, however, it seemed as though no one cared to have this exalted experience with God. Corruption was so deep-rooted in Israel that the people generally gave no response to the prophet's pleas for Isaiah's spiritual life. Ellen G. White in Prophets and Kings, page 281, says, or provides the following insight. Through the men of God that had appeared before the altar of Bethel, through Elijah and Elisha, these are the men of God, okay? Through Amos and Hosea, the Lord had repeatedly set before the ten tribes the evil of disobedience. But notwithstanding reproof and entreating, Israel had sunk lower and still lower in apostasy. What a sad, sad picture. All right? So let's, let's now look at verses eight, eight, uh, 8 to 11 of chapter 11. And yet God will return them to their homes. And will return them to their homes. Hosea 11, 8. Hosea chapter 11, verses 8 to 11. Somebody can read that for me. Uh, I can read. God tells us through the prophet Hosea, uh, how can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I set you like Zebulun? My heart churns within me. My sympathy is stirred. I will not ex execute the, fire, the fierceness of my anger. I will not again destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not man, the Holy One in your minds, in your midst, and I will not come with terror. They shall walk after the Lord. He will roar like a lion. When he roars, then his sons shall come trembling from the west. They shall come trembling like a bird from Egypt, like a dove from the land of Assyria, and I will let them dwell in their houses, said the Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Allah. This is so beautiful. I, I hope you, you, you can see the, the God that we serve, the God that calls us people. This is a God that looks 
iniquity. And he's frustrated with iniquity. And yet he says, how, how can I hand you over Israel? How can I make you like the, the, the cities that were destructed? We're going to go through all that. My heart churns within me. We're going to touch that. As if God had an earthquake in his heart. We're going to, we're going to touch that. In verse 8, the two cities mentioned, Adma and Zebulim, were located east of the Dead Sea. These were cities of the plain that were destroyed when Sodom and Gomorrah were also destroyed. Let's read Genesis 19, verses 24 and 25. Then the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. So he overthrew the all, all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. In this verse, verse 8, we see one of the most amazing descriptions of God's inner struggle in Scripture. One of the most. And I want you to pay attention on that. First, God asks the question, how can I give, you, give up Ephraim? How can I hand you over Israel? How can I destroy you like I destroyed the cities of Adma and Zebulim? And then... God tells us in this verse that my art churns within me. By the way, the same Hebrew word is used to refer to the destruction of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. When God destroyed those cities, his art churned within him. You know, God is not a God that loves to destroy. Destruction is the result of evil and sin. Note, what happened with God's heart is compared to an earthquake. It is as if God experiences within his heart what Israel experiences in exile. The thought process recorded in verse, verse 8 represents a transition from dire prediction of fear, chastisement to comforting promises of mercy. Can you see that? God's attachment to his people is that strong. God is a God of compassion, a key virtue in God's dealing with sinful and frail humanity. Frequently in Hosea's prophecy, threats and promises alternate and sometimes commingle. Although Israel merited complete destruction because of his iniquities, the Lord, because of his enduring love and mercy, continued to strive for repentance and reformation on the part of his people. Jeremiah 31.20 tells us, Is Ephraim my dear son? Let me read it this way. Is Israel my dear son? That's really what he's saying. Is he a pleasant child? For though I spoke against him, I earnestly remember him still. Therefore my heart yearns for him. I will surely have mercy on him, says the Lord. You know how comforting this is? It's so comforting to me. Because I know that when I have sinned, my Lord still says, is Victor my son? In verse 9, the prophet Hosea paints a glorious picture of the working of divine love. God will not execute the burning heat of his wrath, nor destroy Ephraim completely. Please understand. If God's love in the beginning of his interest in Israel was something great and exalted, it is something greater now. God is showing compassion, and he refuses to give up his people, a people altogether unworthy of the love God had shown them. While many punish to destroy, God punishes to correct and amend. You see, when God punishes, it's not to destroy. It is to correct and the man, Jeremiah chapter 29, 11, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. To give you a future and a hope. In verse 9, God also reminds Israel that he is God. That his basic reason for the divine mercy 
just expressed. That is the basic reason. After all, God's inherently holy character cannot but honor and fulfill his covenant of everlasting love with Israel. Romans chapter 8, verses 37 to 39. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded, and this is Paul's at its best, for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. That's just beautiful. God is the Holy One. This explains why God punishes iniquity and yet continues to show mercy. The holiness that cannot tolerate the guilty is also the holiness of truth and faithfulness. I want you to look at God that, that way. He is holy. He cannot, he cannot tolerate wickedness. But because he is holy, he is all about faithfulness and truthfulness to his covenant. In verse 10 and 11, Scripture tells us that they shall walk after the Lord like many other passages in, in the prophetic writings. God's voice suddenly shifts and the possibility of hope emerges. Throughout your relationship with God, there is admonition, but is also hope, as if to express God's deep desire the repentance of his people. Chapter 11. I hope you enjoyed that. I hope it gave you an insight of uh, a God that loves his children, is concerned with his children. And so, God's love despite Israel's rebellion. Now let's look, let's look at Israel's rebellion and God's chastisement. And by the way, you've heard that from, from Brian, I mean from Byron, you've heard it from Barbara, you're going to hear it from here a little bit. And so let's look into that. We, we're now going to, to, uh, to review and study chapters 11 verses 12 to uh, chapter 13, uh, uh, and, uh, and um, yes, to, to chapter 12 verses 6. Okay, so, Ibrahim, Israel, is full of sin. This is the title of this section, uh, chapter 11, verses 12 to chapter 12, verses 6. Israel is full of sin, and while Judah still walks with God to a degree, God has complaint against Judah as well. So, Judah, the sister nation, the sister nation that God has is also not quite, quite there yet. Okay? A little wicked. So, somebody could read for me Isaiah verses 11, uh, uh, chapter 11, verses 12 to chapter 12, verse 6. Hosea? Hosea. Yeah, yeah sure. Hosea or Isaiah? Hosea. 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 Um, Ephraim has encircled me with lies, and the house of Israel with deceit. But Judah still walks with God. Even the Holy One who is faithful. Ephraim feeds on the wind and pursues the east wind. He daily increases lies and desolation. Also they make a covenant with the Assyrians and oil is carried to Egypt. The Lord also brings a charge against Judah and will punish Jacob according to his ways. According to his deeds, he will recompense him. Verse 3, he took his brother by the heel in the womb, and in his strength he struggled with God. Yes, he struggled with the angel and prevailed. He wept and sought favor from him. He found him in Bethel, and there he spoke to us. That is the Lord God of hosts. The Lord is his memorable name. So you, by the help of your God, return, observe mercy and justice. And wait on your Lord or on your God continually. Thank you, Byron. Thank you. 
this is a great introduction to a discussion that we uh, are going to develop through these verses. In chapter 11, verses 12, and chapter 12, verses 1, Prophet Hosea contrasts the open idolatry of the North Kingdom, Israel, to the spiritual condition of the Southern Kingdom of Judah, which at this stage was still walking with God. Okay? The expression Ephraim feeds on the wind is an allusion to worthless political moves. Instead of seeking the Lord as the source of safety, Israel resorted to foreign allegiance to assist in holding up its waning power. You saw it with Assyria. You saw it with Egypt. You see, only the Lord is faithful, reliable, and dependable. In verse 2 of chapter 12, however, Hosea also brings to light the similarities of Judah's and Jacob's sins of deceitfulness and distrust. Here Judah is included in God's complaint against his people. Judah's transgression at this time was not so serious as that of Israel because the nation was still outwardly loyal to the Lord and was not so openly guilty of apostasy as was Israel. Nevertheless, Judah was not perfect and must also fa fa face punishment. In the book of Hosea, the names of patriarchs or places are not chosen by chance. Here in verse 2, Jacob denotes, and I want you to pay attention to that, because in the Bible often that is the case. Jacob denotes the northern kingdom in contrast to Judah. However, in a large and more general sense, Jacob covers both the ten tribes making up Israel, as well as the two tribes which make up Judah. He is the father. Jacob's experience is alluded to both kingdoms. For his sin and repentance, and, and we're talking about Jacob's, God's touching aim is to invite people to move on from Jacob's initial sinful choices to his later experience of repentance. So if you know the story of Jacob, you know what Jacob went through, and you know the repentance that he went through, and how faithful he became. And so, God is really using Hosea by bringing the patriarch and preaching the patriarch's injustices or wrongdoings and repentance and a renewal walk with the Lord. This is beautiful. So, thus in verse 3, the prophet refers to two prominent events in the life of Jacob. Hosea's objective is to admonish his people to imitate the conduct of their progenitor and to remind them of the distinction he had obtained thereby as an encouragement to them, hoping that they would do likewise. So, at Jacob's birth, he laid hold of his eldest brother's heel. Two incidents, that's the first. This was an incident that led him, Jacob, to receive the name of Jacob. Genesis chapter 25, 26 tells us, Afterward, Esau's brother came out, and his hand took hold of Esau's heel. Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. Who she? No, Rebecca. Yes, show them. So the, se the second incident mentioned tells us how Jacob, in the maturity of his manhood, wrestles with God. So the first incident that, that uh, Hosea is pinpointing is, here is the second, the second born holding on to that hill. Never let go until he was out and born. Yes, yes, correct. And then the second incident is his wrestling with God, the author of the covenant, and prevailed so that his name was changed from Jacob to Israel. The word Israel really means either one of these. He fights with God, he prevails over God, or he rules with God. 
Genesis 32, 28 tells us, And God said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with man and have prevailed. Ooh, that is powerful. Powerful. Jacob begun that night with struggle, but ended it in supplication. Note, the purpose to wrestle with God is not to conquer him, but to conquer self. You've seen that experience with David, King David. You've seen that experience with prophets that, that wrestled with God. And the purpose to wrestle with God is not to conquer him, but to conquer self. The acknowledgement of weakness is our power. Those who come to God and will not let him go until they are blessed discover that God provides them power. God's presence is the source of power. Verse 4 explains and describes why the experience Jacob had with God is an example for God's people to follow. The experience brings out a couple of important lessons. Number one, the efficacy, the effectiveness of an earnest and persistent prayer. Jacob did not give way before the dangers that threatened him nor succumb under the difficulties of his position. He bravely faced the discouragements that surrounded him. However, not in his own strength, but by the strength God gave him, he had power with God. And so he Ephesians chapter 6 verses 18 tells us, Pray always with all power and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Philippians chapter 4, 6 says, Be anxious for nothing, for everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God. And 1 Thess Thessalon Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 17 says, and you should know this by heart, Pray without ceasing. Secondly, only through God's help can we overcome the problem of evil in our lives. You see, the touch that crippled Jacob's thigh and took away his strength revealed for all time that human, the human inability to prevail in the conflict of sin and demonstrated what God can do if we will place ourselves in his hand. Matthew chapter 1 verses 21. And she will bring forth a son, forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. John 15, 5. I am the vine, says Christ. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Hebrews 13, 20, th chapter 13, verses 20 and 21. Now may the God of peace who brought, you, who brought up your, our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. So in verse 6, people are called to patiently wait on God. This is a call to repent and trust God. The proof of sincerity in heeding this appeal is to be demonstrated first toward the fellow man by keeping mercy and judgment, that's how we love our fellow man. And secondly, toward God by waiting on him continually. This brings out the fundamental fact that in our weak and helpless condition, only by God's help can we develop the character we ought to possess. John chapter 15 verses 4 and 5 say, Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Verse 5. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. 
if Israel would weigh on God. They would rest in security and not be afraid of their enemies. We must wait on God because of our need of him amid the dangers that surround us. For in God is the only source of strength and sufficiency. Waiting on God denotes waiting on him in expectation and hope, trusting in him for help and looking to him for deliverance. Psalm 27, verse 14, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and God will strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Psalm 40, verses 1 to 3, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He also brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the Maya clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my steps. He has put a new song in my mouth. Praise to our God. Many will see it and fear and will trust in the Lord. Now let's look at verses. So we, we've, we've looked at uh, um, chapter 11, verses 12 to chapter 12, verses 6. Now look, let's look at verses 7 to 14. Could somebody read that for me? And by the way, uh, we are going to look at Ibrahim or uh, um, Ephraim or Israel is cunning and boastful, and so God will bring his reproach upon him. Okay? So, would somebody read those? Uh, I'll read it. Okay. A cunning Canaanite. Deceitful scales are in his hand. He loves to oppress. And Ephraim said, Surely I have become rich. I have found wealth for myself. In all my labors they shall find in me no iniquity that is sin. But I am the Lord your God ever since the land of Egypt. I will again make you dwell in tents as in the days of the appointed feasts. I have also spoken by the prophets and have multiplied visions. I have given symbols throughout the witness of prophets of the prophets. Though Gilead has idols, surely they are vanity. Though they sacrifice bulls in Gilgal, indeed their altar shall be heaps in the furrows of the field. Jacob fled to the country of Syria. Israel served for a spouse and for a wife he tended sheep. By a prophet the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt, and by a prophet he was preserved. Ephraim provoked him to anger most bitterly. Therefore his Lord will leave the guilt of his bloodshed upon him and return his reproach upon him. Thank you. In verses 7 to 11, prophet Isaiah provides provides a further description of Israel's apostasy. It's, by the way, this book develops these iniquities. This apostasy presents a strong contrast to Jacob's earnestness to obtain the divine blessing. The sincerity of his repentance, the evidences of his conversion, and his consist consistent waiting on God. And so there, there is... The, there, there is this comparison that has been made between, between the patriarch, Jacob, and the children, the nation of Israel. Okay, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 19 says, And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in the dark place. No, no, I th I'm, I'm sorry, guys. I am, I am, so I'm sorry, I am very sorry. Okay, let's, let's go back. This sad condition of the nation prompts Hosea to identify a few more of Ephraim's spiritual degeneracies. He speaks of Israel as being a materialistic-minded axter and exploiter given to fraud and oppression instead of showing mercy and justice as God required. The Israelites had descended into greedy, dishonest, oppressive, and deceitful people. But Ephraim, or Israel, boasted of its riches, in spite of the fact that they were accused of fraud and violence during the reigns of uh, Jehoash and Jeroboam II, Israel's self-confidence and strange forgetfulness of God 
blinded them of the knowledge of their real spiritual condition. You see, often prosperity is poor food for the soul and a constant danger to the attainment of eternal life. Can I say something? Like yes. As you read this, Israel boasting its riches and its pride of the fact that they were accused of fraud and violence. This is exactly the characters of the, you know, if you read last day events, yep. chapter 8 about the city of San Francisco is exactly yeah. like this. Yeah, so, so true, so true. So, so in verse 9, thank you, thank you, Eva, absolutely right. So in verse 9, God provides a warning that as the Jews were once in bondage in Egypt, so again the Lord would put them in a land of bondage, and this would be Assyria. This is a promise that as God brought his people out of Egypt and had them dwell in tents in the wilderness on their way to the promised land, so he will do that again. But this, this is also a threat that God would drive his people out of their pleasant land and put them in a wilderness state because of their iniquity, their pride, and ingratitude. Chapter 12 of Hosea ends with a couple of interesting statements and comparison. In verse 12 and verse 13, Jacob's flight to and his servitude for Laban are compared to Israel's experience in Egypt. This may suggest that the distress and affliction of Jacob are presented as a contrast with the exaltation of his posterity, the exaltation of Israel, his descendants. The object of this contrast is to impress God's people with God's goodness to them in rescuing them from their bondage, to inspire them to be grateful to God, and humbly acknowledge God's mercy. In verse 13, Hosea reminds Israel that just as Israel of old was preserved by the prophet Moses, so will God's people be preserved by giving heed to the appointed messengers of God and ordering their lives in harmony with the counsel imparted. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 19. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place. Until the day dawns and morning star rises in your hearts. In verse 14, Hosea states clearly that Israel's falseness and lack of devotion provoked the Lord to be the anger. Thus, Ephraim's guilt or Israel's guilt and punishment would not be removed. Judges chapter 20 Verses 20, uh, chapter 2, verses 20. Then the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And he said, Because this nation has transgressed my covenant which I commended their fathers, or my covenant which I commended their fathers, and has not heeded my voice. Verse 21. I also will no longer drive out before them any of the nations which Joshua left when he died. You see, Hosea goes on to say that the dishonor that Ephraim offered to God through idolatry and iniquity shall return to them. Those who rebel against God and bring reproach upon his name must expect divine retribution. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 30. Therefore the Lord God of Israel says, I said indeed that your house and the house of your father would walk before me forever. But now the Lord says, fear, far be it from me. For those who honor me, I will honor. And those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. That's an interesting situation, isn't it? God makes a promise, you'll always be mine. And then he says, okay, you obviously don't want to be mine. Can I ask a question? So those who want to be mine will be mine, but the others won't. Can I ask a question? Sure. So God sent Hosea to Israel during this time, right? Right. So who is it God sent to, 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 to New York now to talk to the... Well, we know because we studied this. How about the people who doesn't know? 
like in Chicago, San Francisco, Los Angeles, who does God, who does God send? And that is uh, the question that you and I need to answer every day. God, where do you want me to be today? Where do you want me to be today? Israelites did only had the Old Testament. We also have the New Testament. Right. It's like the two witnesses. So right. there is a second witness for our times, right. which is the New Testament. All right. The third part of this, uh, this, uh, the, uh, um, the, 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 we're now going to look in, we, we're going to go into chapter 13, uh, 13 of, um, of uh, um, Hosea. And uh, uh, the title for this particular chapter is Abraham, uh, Ephraim, in other words, Israel and Samaria, and Samaria was the capital of Israel, both representative of Israel, shall be held guilty and punished accordingly. So the next verses, verses 1 to 16, are going to deal with um, God's provided punishment for idolatry, Would somebody read that for me? It's uh, quite extensive. Sure. Um, all righty. So in chapter 13, or in chapter 13, Hosea, we read about the inevitable judgment of Israel. Here is what the chapter says. When Ephraim spoke trembling, he exalted himself in Israel. But when he offended through ball worship, he died. Now they sin more and more and have made for themselves molded images idols of their silver according to their skill all of it is the work of craftsmen they say of them let the men who sacrifice kiss the calves yeah. therefore they shall be like the morning cloud and like the early dew that passes away like chaff blown off from the threshing floor and like smoke from a chimney yet I am the Lord your God ever since the land of Egypt and you shall know no God but me, for there is no Savior besides me. I knew you in the wilderness, in the land of great drought. When they had pasture, they were filled. They were filled, and their heart was exalted. Therefore they forgot me. So I will be to them like a lion, like a leopard by the road. I will lurk. I will meet them like a bear deprived of her cubs. I will tear open their rib cage, and there I will devour them like a lion. The wild beast shall tear them. O oh, Israel, you are destroyed, but your help is from me. I will be your king. Where is any other that he may save you in all your cities? And your judges to whom you said, give me a king. And princess, I gave you a king in my anger and took him away in my wrath. The iniquity of Ephraim is bound up. His sin is stored up. The sorrows of a woman in childbirth shall come upon him. He is an unwise son, for he should not stay long where children are born. I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O oh, death, I will be your plagues. O oh, grave, I will be your destruction. Pity is, hid, or pity is yeah, hidden from my eyes. Though he is fruitful among his brethren, an east wind shall come. The wind of the Lord shall come up from the wilderness. Then his spring shall become dry. And his foundation shall be dried up. Mountain. He shall plunder the treasury of every desirable prize. Samaria is held guilty, for she has rebelled against God, her God. They shall fall for the sword, and or their infants shall be dashed in pieces, and their women and child ripped open. That's Thanks so much, uh, Byron. I know this was long. And, that, and I'm, we're going to unpack this. That's, this is what we're doing. We, we're really taking segments and unpack these so that we explain what this is all about. So verses 1 to 8 um, of Hosea show why Ephraim, the northern kingdom of Israel, has destroyed itself. It explains it. Hosea 39 tells us 
O Israel, you are destroyed. But your help is for me. Yes, God really saying, listen, you are destroying yourself. And if you think you need help, where should you come to? To me. The particulars of the nation's sins are given in these verses as are the punishment incurred as a result of these transgressions. This portion of scripture not only tells you the problems, but it, it tells you what is the punishment that's going to be given. So in verse 1, the prophet describes the worship of Baal as being a serious and offending sin committed by God's people. Baal worship was introduced in Israel by King Ahab at the instigation of Queen Jezebel. Scripture tells us in 1 Kings uh, chapter 16, verses 29-33, in the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, the son of Omri, became king over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria 22 years. Now Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord, and pay attention, more than all who were before him. And it came to pass, as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took as wife, uh, that, that he took as wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ephbaal, king of the Sidonians. And I went and served, and he went and served Baal and worshipped him. Then he set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. Samaria was the capital. And Ahab made a wooden image. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. That's significant. So Israel's down, down trend has also to do with leadership. Not only uh, administrative leadership, but spiritual leadership. Jeroboam, when the right. kingdom was divided and he wanted right. to separate himself and solidify his reign, right. so he started the evil worship, like everything Absolutely. contrary to what uh, God had directed, so that he could be different. Absolutely. And then they took it further. Ahab took it further. A Absolutely, Daniel. So note, through the efforts of Elijah and King Jehu, I want you to pay attention to that, because you've read that in Scripture. But I want to, through the efforts of Elijah, the prophet, and King Jehu, this evil received a setback, but was not eradicated, and frequently broke out again. Israel's idolatry resulted in national degradation and political death. Israel lost his high and exalted position. The nation's honor was laid in the dust, and Israel became spiritually dead, ready for the burial to come. Deserting God and delaying with and, and dallying with sin always brings one sure result, and that is death. Ezekiel 33, verses 10 and 11 says, Therefore you, O son of man, say to the house of Israel, Thus you say, If our transgressions and our sins lie upon us, and we pine away in them, how can we then live? Verse 11, say to them, As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn! Turn from your evil ways. For why should you die, O house of Israel? Romans chapter 6, verses 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. In verse 2, Hosea transitions from the time of the introduction of Baal worship to Israel's condition during his time. So what, what Hosea is now going to talk about Israel is what he sees every day. Okay, As he describes in, in this verse, it was the highest thing to make and worship a graven image as a material representation of the true God, as did Jeroboam the first. This was a violation of the second commandment. Israel chose to neglect the solemn instruction that the worship of God must be spiritual, not material. It was not about 
a piece of stone or wood. John chapter 4, verses 24 says, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. It was Inus to introduce other gods, such as the Phoenician Baal, in direct violation of the first commandment, which requires the exclusive worship of the Lord. Exodus 23 says, you shall have no other gods before me. Unfortunately, during Isaiah's time, all forms of idolatry had infiltrated Israel until the nation was fairly saturated with false religion. No wonder, in verse 3, God speaking through Isaiah to inform Israel that their prosperity is to be short-lived. Israel's apostasy will bring upon the nation sure and swift punishment. Note, the four figures mentioned in this verse. Verse 3, the morning cloud, the early dew, the chaff, and the smoke very expressively denote the transient nature of Israel's nature, uh, na national existence. Can you see that? So, the morning cloud. That's what Israel looked like. The early dew. The chaff disappearing with the wind. The smoke. Can you see it? Okay. In verse 4, Hosea refers to God as the only true God. All other gods are frauds. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 10 to 12 says, You are my witnesses, says the Lord, and my servant, whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, nor shall there be after me. Verse 11, I, even I, am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. I have declared and saved. I have proclaimed and there was no foreign God among you. Therefore, you are my witnesses, says the Lord, that I am God, says God. The deliverance of Israel from Egypt was a mighty if evidence of God's power. Mighty. From the time God's people were in Egypt, the Lord gave them his favor. God knew his people and cared for them. They should have retained a knowledge of God by preserving his worship. In verse 6, it is really sad to see that Israel had shamelessly forgotten God and the blessings he provided. Instead of remembering God gratefully and shaping their lives in accordance with his abundant favor toward them, the people were filled with pride and had forgotten their maker. Fire. Absolutely. Dead on. Yep. It's only during problems you see people really buckle down and pray and look for God. But yeah. it's amazing how filled the churches were during COVID. <laughs> Dead on. Dead on. Dead on. So in verses 7 and 8, God provides a picture that fittingly describes the distraction that inescapably will follow Israel's sin. So the lion, and this is beautiful. I want you to look at this carefully. The lion with its ferocity and the leopard with its fleetness symbolize the soon coming invasion of the Assyrians that will bring to an end the northern kingdom of Israel. The fatted sheep with their luxuriant pasture. Who do you think that represents? Israel. As Hosea describes in verse 6, will soon become the prey of the lion and the leopard and the she-bear. Okay, we'll talk about it. In verse 8, God says that he will meet them like a bear deprived of her cubs and will tear open the rib cage. A bear that is deprived of her cubs will fight to death. Hmm. Note, the three wild beasts mention the lion, the leopard, and the bear aptly display the power of God's wrath and the fury of his anger. 
If the sinner escaped from the lion, the leopard would overtake him. If he escaped from the leopard, the savage she bear would meet him. It seems as if the Lord, through Hosea, is trying to explain to his people with cumulative force the realization of what the visitation of divine wrath means. Unfortunately, Israel had closed their heart against God. The divine punishment is pictured as the rending of this closed heart by a lion. 2 Kings chapter 17, verses 5 and 6 says, Neither king of Assyria went throughout all the land, and went up to Samaria and besieged it for three years. In the ninth year of Hosea, the king of Assyria took Samaria and carried Israel away to Assyria and placed them in Allah and by the, uh, by, by the Haber, the river of Gazan, and in the cities of the Medes. So in verse 9, Hosea tells us that Israel destroyed themselves with the weapons of pride, idolatry, sensuality, and anarchy. Can you see that being repeated today? Sin is ever suicidal. Proverbs chapter 8, 36 says, But he who sins against me wrongs his own soul. All those who hate me love death. So who destroys who? Who destroys who? The sinner destroys him or herself. Who's your worst enemy? Yeah. Myself. 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 Ezekiel chapter 8 verses 20 says, The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. Ellen G. White in Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, pages 120, page 120 says, God destroys no one. I want you to pay attention to that. God destroys no one. The sinner destroys himself by his own penitence. When a person once neglects to heed the invitations, reproofs, and warnings of the Spirit of God, his conscience becomes seared, and the next time he is admonished, it will be more difficult to heal obedience than before. And thus, with every repetition, conscience is the voice of God erred amid the conflict of human passion. When it is resisted, the Spirit of God is grieved. Pay attention. In verses 10 and 11, in the Christ, yes. Just real quick, that's the only unpardonable sin is grieving that's exactly. the Holy Spirit. Exactly right. Yeah. That's exactly That's exactly right. In verses 7 and 11, in the crisis now before Israel, the threat of an Assyrian invasion, the Lord asks the following questions. This is beautiful. This is now the Lord trying to get the attention of the people. It's never too late until the close of probation. It's never too late. So he's God asking, where is now the king that will lead Israel to the defense of all their cities and their fortresses and give them victory? Where are the judges and the princes that will act as deliveries from danger? What is God really saying? When Samuel was in charge and Samuel was working through me, you wanted a king. And you've had a king now for many a years. And where is that king that is going to save you? That's really what God is saying. Where is that king? You put me aside, and you wanted men, sinful men, to really rule like all the other nations. Where's the king? It is obvious that many of the kings, princes, and judges in Israel were just not capable to take care of God's people. They failed the Lord 
and they failed God's people. In Patriarchs and Prophets, pages 605 and 606, Ellen White provides the following insight. God permitted the people to follow their own choice because they refused to be guided by his counsel. Hosea declares that God gave them a king in his anger when men chose to have their own way without seeking counsel from God or in op op opposition to his revealed will. God often grants their desires in order that through the bitter experience that follows, they may be led to realize their folly and to repent of their sin. Did you pay attention to that statement? Human pride and wisdom will prove a dangerous guide. That which the heart desires contrary to the will of God will in the end be found a curse rather than a blessing. Thus, pay attention to this statement. It is a sobering thought that God may punish human beings by granting them their wish. Verse 12 and 13 speaks of the inevitability of judgment at end. Verse 12 affirms that God had carefully kept Ephraim's sins. Well, that not, may not be a very good news, but we know that there is a book. There are books in heaven. That's what happens. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 30, 34 and 35 tells us, not laid up in store with me, sealed up among he treasures. Vengeance is mine, and recompense is mine, says the Lord. Their foot shall slip in due time, for the day of their calamity is at end, and the things to come hasten upon them. Now Ephraim's day of reckoning has come. In verse 13, Hosea compares the punishment of which God warns Israel with to the violent, sudden, irresistible throes of a woman in labor. This means that Israel's iniquity will be followed by severe su sufferings and many sorrows. And yet, these worldly sorrows may, under divine grace, result in the godly sorrows of repentance. And that's the beauty of who God is. Verse 14 warns that because the iniquity of Ephraim is bound up, God will not rescue the people from death. That he is, in fact, calling upon death and Sheol to do their work. And that compassion will be absent from him while he does what he is for him, a strange work. Isaiah 28, 21 says, For the Lord will rise up as at Mount Perazim. He will be angry as the valley of Gibeon, that he may do his work his awesome work, and bring to pass his act is unusual, unusual act. And what is God's unusual act? Allow you to be destroyed because you chose to do so. Allow us to be destroyed. In the last two verses of chapter 13, verses 15 and 16, God speaks of east winds in Palestine coming from the desert. These winds tended to be hot and scorching. Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 17 says, I will scatter them as with a, an east wind before the enemy. I will show them the back and not the face in the day of their calamity. calamity. The mighty armies of Assyria are represented by this wind imagery. It is the Assyrian conqueror who coming from the east like a devastating east wind, would ravage and spoil Israel and take them all away. That was chapter 13. Paints the picture of the, the sins, the iniquities, the problems, and tells them what's going to happen. So chapter 14 is a beautiful chapter. I'm so glad that Hosea ends with chapter 14 because chapter 14 is about restoration future restoration. And there's only nine verses, so let's, uh, let's go and, uh, and study chapter 14 of Hosea. Chapter 14 of Hosea is a fitting climax to God's message through Hosea. On this chapter, God makes one last appeal to his people.
to forsake their iniquity and turn to the Lord. Well, what does that remind you? There will be one last appeal before God comes to take us home. There will be one last appeal. That last appeal is taking place as we speak. The three angels' message is the last appeal that God is making. And that will come to an end when the close of probation comes to an end. Just likewise, God is making a last appeal to the nation of Israel and Judah here. On this chapter, God makes one last appeal. It was not yet too late, but the day of opportunity was fast sleeping away. The war clouds were darkening on the eastern horizon. Assyria was at the zenith of its power, and its imperialistic ambitions were soon to engulf the nation of Israel. And so is the devil getting prepared for that war, that final war here on earth. Just like Assyria was at the zenith of its power and its imperialistic ambition, so will the beasts and the, the dragon empower themselves just before the Lord comes. So let's first deal with a call to return to the Lord because Assyria will not save. See what the Lord is really saying to Assyria. He says, okay, you now have gone to Assyria, but you think they can save you? So let's deal with that. In Hosea chapter 14, verses 1 and 3 says, God pleads with Israel to return to him. Here's what the scripture says, O oh, Israel, return to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Take words with you. Return to the Lord. Say to him, take away all iniquity. Receive us graciously, for we will offer the sacrifices of our lips. And then verse 3 says, Assyria shall not save us. We will not ride on horses. Nor will we say any more to the work of our hands, You are our gods, for in you the fatherless finds mercy. And he's talking about the idols they had. Wooden idols, stone idols, maybe even gold idols. The first three verses of chapter 14 describes Hosea's appeal to the nation of Israel to forsake their iniquity and turn to the Lord. It's an appeal. God's appeal. It reviews the major condemnation and criticism of Israel's conduct. Idolatry. Reliance on military alliances rather than in God and apostasy. And puts them in the setting of repentance and renunciation. Thus in verse 1, the prophet urges Israel to return to the Lord. In verse 2, Hosea appeals to Israel to return to the Lord in heartfelt repentance and confession. Note that Hosea did not ask Israel to offer animal sacrifices or provide material gifts. The problem was the condition of the heart and the mind. And so what was important was to acknowledge their sin, confess, and repent from it. In return, they could expect God's mercy and forgiveness. In Psalm 32, one tells us, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Who covers the sin? God. God. Okay, yes, boy. When you think of it this way, Judah actually laid it out before the Lord when Assyria came to them and God had mercy on them and saved them and one angel took out 185,000 soldiers. That's exactly right. It's exactly so right. If Israel would have repented, two brothers. It's exactly know, right. Problem solved. Yeah. It's, it's really a mess, you know. Yeah. From the beginning. Yeah. I mean, even from Jacob's mm -hmm. time. I mean, the point I'm trying to say when Hosea say, Hosea say, repent, repent, go back to God, right? Yeah. I mean, do they know all this? Do the children of, the, for example, right. Victor's children, do they know God? Israel's children, do they know God? Well, that's Hosea exactly. Say that? That's exactly the problem. That's exactly the problem. We, we are a, an image of the sons of Jacob. And yes, God has so much love, and you'll see it in this chapter that we are opening now. The, the love of God is such that not only has he retained a remnant throughout, throughout history, but there will be people that will return to God 
and it will be God's children forever and ever. That's the beauty. So, sin throughout, uh, th sin, thoroughly re sin thoroughly repented of can be briefly forgiven. See, that's who God is. Once forgiven, it is no longer reckoned to the sinner's account. God tells us that. Psalm 32 2 says, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. In verse 3, Hosea tells the nation of Israel that Assyria will not save them. He tells them that Assyria will not help them. He tells them that the horses and the armies and chariots of Egypt will not be able to rescue them. And regarding idolatry, Isaiah tells them that the idols they made and worshipped cannot do anything for them. So then, in verses 4 to 7, God promises to heal their backsliding and return them to the land. This is who, who our God is. So let's read that. Could somebody read that for me? Verses 4 to 7 of Isaiah 14. God makes the following promises. Um, I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely, for my anger has turned away from him. I will be like the dew to Israel. He shall grow like the lily and lengthen his roots. Like Lebanon. Uh, like Lebanon. His branches shall spread. His beauty shall be like an olive tree and his fragrance like Lebanon. Those who dwell under his shadow shall return. They shall be revived like grain and grow like a vine. Their scent shall be like the wine of Lebanon. Ah, uh, this is, I, I love this passage of scripture. I have to tell you I love this passage. Okay, let's unpack it. Just let's unpack it. So in verses four to seven, Hosea provides a note of hope We've got to live with hope every day, guys. Every day we need to live with hope. God's blessings and restoration, if they forsake their iniquity and turn to the Lord. So what? God's blessings. So it's not only hope, but it's God's blessings and restoration. If they forsake their iniquity and turn to the Lord. Verse 4 provides God's response to the penitential prayer of a repentant heart. Backsliding is a disease. Only God can heal the healness of the soul. Jeremiah 8.22 tells us, Is there any balm in Gilead? Is there any physician there? Balm is medication. Is there any physician there? Why then is there no recovery for the health of my people? That speaks to what you stated, Eva. Only repentance can cure sin. When sins are forgiven and the righteousness of Christ covers the sinner, then the sinner is accepted before God as if he had never sinned. That's how gracious our God is. His past records of sin is of no wise help against him, and God loves him as he loves his own son. In verse 5, Hosea tells the nation of Israel that God is like the dew to Israel. Now, what does that mean? God would become the source of Israel's spiritual fruitfulness. As the dew comes night after night, so God, God day by day supplies sufficient grace and blessing for each one of us. And then in verse 6, Hosea provides a picture of prosperity if Israel repents and chooses God. Oh, I like this picture. And by the way, this is repeated in some other books of Scripture, particularly in the Old Testament. The prophet uses the olive tree, pay attention, the olive tree to exemplify this prosperity. The olive tree has been called the crown of the fruit trees in Palestine. By the way, Portugal is quite far from Palestine, and so is Spain. And the olive tree in the Iberic Peninsula is also considered, um, yes, it was especially valuable. Its oil was used as food and provided light. Okay, 
Can you imagine this in a spiritual sense? The oil, food, and light. Who is the oil? The Holy Spirit. Okay. Exactly. It's fruitage. The fruitage. So plentiful and useful. It's green, so splendid. And it's foliage, so enduring, fresh. Provided a vivid picture of Israel's glorious prosperity. In verse 7, Isaiah paints a picture of prosperity. In restoration, God's land stands as God's shadow for his people and the nations. I don't know if you ever understood that. Israel, when God took the people from Egypt all the way to Israel and provided the land, what was that land to be? God's shadow for his people and the nations. The last image pictures God as a green tree. So God not only wants you and I to be part of the grove, the olive tree grove, but he pictures himself as a tree. And so what does he say? It is worthy to note that through the prophet Hosea, the Lord endeavored to make the outlook appear as appealing as possible in the hope that his invitation to Israel to return to the Lord and to repent would not be refused. This appeal constitutes a fitting climax to the book of Hosea. Ellen G. White in Christ Object Lessons, page 67, tells us, if we keep our minds stayed upon Christ, he will come unto us as the rain, as the latter and former rain unto the earth. She quotes from Hosea chapter 6, verses 3. As the son of righteousness, God will arise upon us with healing in his wings. She quotes from Malachi chapter 4, verses 2. We shall grow as the lily. We shall revive as the corn and grow as the vine. And we find that in verses 5 and 7 of Hosea chapter 14. By constantly relying upon Christ as our personal Savior, we shall grow up into him in all things. Remember, a little while ago we were talking about, I am the vine and you are the branches. We cannot grow by ourselves. We've got to grow in Christ. Verse 8. Israel will finally be cured of her idol idolatry. This is good news. But let's, let's, let's look at this carefully. Exactly. Let's look at this carefully. Isaiah 14, verses 8, we read, Ephraim shall say, what have I to do anymore with idols? Ooh. I have heard and observed him. I am like a green cypress tree. Your fruit is found in me. There's this hope that Israel is going to say, no more bow, no more idols. No more associations with anybody else. No more idolatry. No more anything else. I want to be part of the garden where God is the center tree of the garden. I want to be like a cypress. Do you read that? Read that? It's beautiful. It is worth knowing that God fulfilled his promise to restore Israel and Judah in Jerusalem. He fulfilled that promise. Starting with the decree of Cyrus and under the leadership of Zerubbabel, Ezra, and Nehemiah. What happened in Jerusalem? The people of God got together and there was what? Rebuilding, restoration, and rebuilding. Exactly. As indicated in Hosea chapter 14 8, Israel was once for all cured of her idolatry. When exile came to an end, and those that wanted to be of God left Babylon and came back, that was restoration. That was restoration. It's beautiful. No idolatry never had the appeal it once had. And finally, verse 9 is the last verse. 
a concluding call to wisely consider these things. I love this verse. I have fallen in love with this verse. I really have. Hosea 14.9 says, Victor, who's wise? Well, let him understand these things. Victor, who's prudent? Let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right. The righteous walk in them. But transgressors, they stumble in them. Hosea closes his prophetic message with a plea that his people give earnest attention to all the words the Lord has spoken through him. Two very different journeys lay before Israel. Two very different journeys lays before you and me every day of this world. Two different journeys. They could either continue in their wicked ways and reap the inevitable results, or they could turn all heartedly to God and obtain salvation. The Lord's ways being, up, uh, being upright and unchangeable will be accomplished despite what human beings may choose to do. That's important that you and I know. God's way will be accomplished in spite of what you and I may choose to do. Malachi 3.6 says, For I am the Lord. See what the Lord says? I do not change. Therefore you are not consumed or sons of Jacob. James 1.17 tells us, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation of shadow of turning. So if human beings are lost, the blame must rest on them or with them. God has confronted them with every inducement possible to ensure they follow the right way. The standards of righteousness are the ways of the Lord. How we relate to them determines if we are considered righteous or wicked. Let me repeat the last statement of, of this presentation. The standards of righteousness are the ways of the Lord. How we relate to them determines if we are considered righteous or wicked. The next, uh, the rest of the presentation really addresses a couple of things that, that allows you to uh, summarize very briefly what you've studied. Concluding lessons to be drawn from Hosea. In the spirit of Hosea 49, which calls upon us to understand and know what is revealed in this book, here are some concluding lessons to be drawn from Hosea. A, or first, our God is a God of love. God loves his people. Just like Hosea loved his wife, Gomer. Remember when, you, when Byron taught that. Just like a father loves his child. Because God loves his people, he blesses them abundantly. And he nurtures them potentially. We saw that in Hosea chapter 11. But God is a God of holiness also. So God is a God of love. But God is also a God of holiness. So consequently, God expects his people to know his will. He expects his people to avoid harmful influences. And God expects his people to sow righteousness, no wickedness. But God is also a God of justice. And because God is a God of justice, he cannot let sin go unpunished. Those who remain in sin will, will devour, will disappear. But God is also a God of mercy, forgiveness, and restoration. God calls upon his people to repent. And he will gladly heal those who repent. And we saw that in chapter 14. In conclusion, conclusion to, to the book of uh, 
Hosea and to tonight's uh, study, Hosea presents a picture of God who is certainly desirous of redeeming those he loves. Sadly, not many look uh, took Hosea's message seriously. And the result was that Assyria conquered Israel and took them all the way. Consequently, only a remnant of Israel returned after the restoration, after the exile, after those 70 years in Babylon. Today, God's redeeming love is offered through His Son, Jesus Christ. You can read that, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 and 7. You can go through the New Testament and read many tests on that. Sadly, not many take the gospel message seriously either. That was Eva's statement a little while ago. Even as Jesus warned, what many need to heed is the call of Hosea at the end of this book. Hosea 14.9 says, Who is wise? Let him understand these things. Who is prudent? Let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right. The righteous walk in them, but transgressors stumble in them. Are we growing in our knowledge of God? That's the question for you and me tonight. Are we walking in the ways of the Lord? As we grow in knowledge, do we put that knowledge in practice? Do we walk in the ways of the Lord? I hope that you enjoyed this presentation. If there are any questions, please do ask. If not, I just want to thank the Lord for a merciful God. What a wonderful God he is. All right? Just one side comment. Yeah. You know, when um, God says that he tries everything possible um, to basically bring people back to him through freedom of choice, yeah. at the end, whether, whatever the judgment may be for you, if it's not so favorable, you can't say that he didn't try. That's exactly right. And try. And, and try. try. Exactly, Mark. So many times. Exactly. So. How many times did, did he sort of, th throughout our studies, the minor prophet studies, or you can go to, to uh, Isaiah, you can go to Jeremiah, you can go to Ezekiel, you can go to, to any of those. Yeah. How many times does he say, because of that, I'm going to do this and this and this and this and this to you. And then there is this appeal for, for um, almost recanting. And what does the Lord do? He recants. He gives you another chance and another chance. God is a God of love and a God of mercy. And what he wants is, to, is you to know that he doesn't condemn anybody. The condemnation, we provide ourselves. We either side with God and we stand with him, or we side with the enemy and we stand with the enemy. And the consequences are real. So this is the God, the God that we serve. And, and so um, the studies that we have done are so wonderful because it, it really provides Above anything else, a great picture of a wonderful God we serve. That's really what it is. All right, let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much for who you are, for your amazing grace. You're a God of mercy. You're a, you're a, a Savior. You're a God that has given us an opportunity to be able to be saved. You came down to this earth. You died, you, you purchased our salvation on the cross, dear Lord. And through grace and our faith in you, we can be heirs of the kingdom with you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for being a God of love. Thank you for being a holy God. Thank you for being a God of justice a God of mercy, a God of forgiveness, a God of restoration. Lord, give us, give us traveling mercies as we go from here to our homes. Provide security and comfort to those that are watching at home. Father, we thank you for the Sabbath. Give us a wonderful Sabbath today. 
And Lord, I want to thank you, not only for your amazing grace, but for your word. Lord, I last ask for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. Purify our hearts. And may the Holy Spirit live within him so that we can be guided, admonished, so that we can be in tune with you 24-7, 365, and walk with you every day. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.